Chapter 30 is on how animals move. Okay, elephants do a groucho gait from Groucho Marx. It's kind of a shuffle. Um, and movement is one of the most distinctive features of animals from elephant, elephants to humans. Uh, obviously, plants don't walk around, but animals do. Movement is dependent on precise interactions among three organ systems. So the nervous system is going to command the, the muscular system. You need the nervous system uh, to control everything. Kind of like in any time we talk about anything, we talk about the nervous system being in control. Then you have the muscular system, which is going to do the movement. It's going to make the force that's going to move the skeleton. And of course, you need the skeletal system because you have to have something to move, something that's a structure that gives support um, and allows the muscles to pull and push again, pull against something, really. Okay, so to sort of evaluate how animals move, uh, they do this on horses. I've seen this on greyhound dogs. Uh, they will put white dots on it and then take a video and have a computer analyze the motion from those white dots. So they're painting it not just for fun here, but it's to put it into a computer program and analyze the game. So you can see in this um, in this slide, uh, that's as fast as an elephant has ever run, they think. Uh, they put some treats off to the right-hand side to make that sucker move. And then again, they, they take a video of that and stick it into a computer program and analyze the gait of the animal. Uh, there's Groucho marks for you. Okay, so diverse means of animal locomotion have evolved. Um, depending on uh, what and where you're traveling through and to, um, it, it depends on how you're going to move. All animals, when they move, are going to use energy. Um, all animals are affected at varying levels from gravity. If they're in the ocean, gravity has less of an effect, but friction has more of an effect. Uh, if we're on land, then we have to worry more and more about gravity. If you're a giraffe, you have to really worry about gravity because gravity, you got to get your heart pumping your circulatory system. Okay, so swimming, water supports against gravity, so gravity not such an effect, uh, but offers frictional resistance. So there's different body structures um, for animals that swim versus animals on land, and their body is going to be streamlined to aid rapid swimming. Now, I know you've never seen a race car shaped like a fish, but they've actually used some of the aerodynamics of fish and dolphins and other things, um, tuna, I believe, as well, to uh, look at the aerodynamics of race cars and airplanes and other things, because what works for them in the ocean also works as you move through air. And yes, that's the cute little crown fish, um, just showing it being aerodynamic. Okay, locomotion on land is going to involve hopping, walking, running, and crawling. Animals that hop, run, walk must expend energy to propel themselves and stay upright. Burrowing or crawling animals must overcome friction as well as gravity issues, and they may move side to side or undulate or by peristalsis. And peristalsis, I know we talk about it in terms of your digestive system, that kind of wave-like action of the smooth muscles that pushes food around. Um, but little earthworms and stuff can also use peristalsis uh, to bunch up and then push forward. It's the same exact uh, motion. Okay, so there's kangaroos hopping and obviously their legs are evolved to be very effective, very large, very powerful, facing the correct direction to propel them forward. Yes, I left this slide in there just because that baby is so dang cute. No other reason because they're not hopping here. You can look at the skeletal system if you like, but really look at the baby. That's just cute. Okay, here we go. Peristalsis. Um, so you can see kind of the bunching up of the head region in the first part of the slide and the elongation. So you have these con muscles that contract and just just like a wave, kind of really just like in your digestive system. This bunches up and then it's going to extend out and narrow out and then touch down um, and then bunch up and then narrow out and touch down. So that's how they move along by peristalsis. Okay, 
Flying is another way of movement, and the wings of birds, bats, and flying insects are airfoils. They're, they're shaped to alter air currents, same as an airplane. Um, and always the top part is going to be fatter than the bottom part. And what that does is it makes a low pressure system right above the wing and provides some lift. It's called the Bernoulli effect. If you want to have fun with it, you can just take a piece of paper, a small strip of paper, hold it up to your chin and blow across the surface of it and it will cause it to lift up. Um, so whether you're looking at birds or airplanes, they all have that same shape. At the cellular level, all animal movement has similarities. It is based on the contractile of microtubules or microfilaments. So when we talk about muscle contraction, that's what we're talking about. All right, there's your airfoil effect. What you have is going across the top, this air, because it gets spread out more because it has to go a farther distance across this rounded top. And um, you get low pressure up here, you have a higher pressure down here, and it provides lift. Skeletal function is for support um, and movement. This is what your muscles are going to pull against. So yes, it gives us support as we stand, but it also provides points of attachment for the muscles, and it protects against our in, uh, protects our internal organs from um, you know getting whacked or punctured or anything else. Okay. A hydrostatic skeleton is fluid held under pressure. And so for that, you can think of a hydra in, in, um, in the water. It works well for aquatic animals or things that burrow by peristalsis. Um, and it's soft and flexible. So the next picture has a hydra. There's the picture of the hydra. You can see one is elongated out, one is shorter and fatter. And it is actually considered a skeletal system, even though it's just uh, pressure. It's just pressure pushing against the cells. Um, but it provides its support. So, okay, an exoskeleton is another form of a skeleton. There are rigid external uh, coverings that cover the muscle and attaches at inner surfaces. So, arthropods have a chitin exoskeleton. Uh, chitin is a protein. They are thin and flexible at the joints. Um, that exoskeleton is secreted by living cells. Uh, it molts periodically, leaving the animal unprotected. So um, as the animal grows and becomes too big for its exoskeleton, the one will fall off, a new one will be created underneath, but it's still not really tough. Um, mollusks have a calcium carbonate exo exoskeleton. So there is your lovely molting crab, um, soft shell crab for sushi. There's your uh, exoskeleton and um, the place where it expands is along the edge there. So for growth, as these grow, they don't molt off, they actually can expand it. Or you can have an endoskeleton, which is a hard or leathery supporting elements um, situated among the soft tissues. We have a hard endoskeleton. Vertebrate skeleton consists of cartilage or a combination of cartilage and bone. So like a shark is cartilage, we have cartilage and bone. All right, Echinodermata perforatus is mm, purple sea urchin. They have a skeleton, it's actually, um, they have sort of this funny symmetry, it's in five parts if you look at it. All right, there's a frog skeleton, um, has some similarities actually to human skeletons and other things. You have um, the skull and you have joints and movement, mm, oddly similar to a human. Okay, the human skeleton is a unique variation on an ancient thing. Skeleton of vertebrates have a number of sim similarities. So they have this axial skeleton. And what that is, is sort of protects the key things. Like forget about movement. Let's just think about um, protecting our brain. Then our vertebrae comes down our back and our ribs. That sort of base skeleton is the ax axial skeleton. Then you have the appendicular skeleton. And that's going to be everything that moves on it, right? Your, your legs, your limbs, your 
arms, your shoulders, all that sort of put on top of this axial skeleton. So the human skeleton reflects bipedal evolution, it means we stand up on our hind legs, look out over the plains of Africa, whatever. It actually has caused some problems. Um, one reason they, they hypothesize as to why humans have uh, trouble delivering babies is because it has changed sort of the shape of the pelvis. Um, the other things that have changed is um, our skull is literally balanced at the top of our backbone. That's different. Other animals uh, that are on four legs support it using sort of the back of their neck. Um, our backbone is S-shaped. Like I said, the pelvis, the pelvis has changed. It's shorter, rounder, and oriented vertically. Uh, good for walking, bad for delivering babies. The bones of hands and feet are adapted for different functions. So um, our feet support us entirely, obviously, and that frees up our hands to do other things. All right, so you can look here, you can see the axial skeleton is in a kind of green color, and everything laid on top is in um, just like regular bone color. Um, you can see examples of joints here, the pelvis, um, okay? Here is a difference of the two animals. You have a, you know, bipedal human over here, quadrupedal uh, bamboo, bamboon over here. Um, our feet are different. If you look at our feet, uh, our heel, actually our big toe supports a lot of our weight, believe it or not. Um, the pelvis is hugely different, right? The way that has rotated is very, very different on a human. The way that our head is supported is also different. And the versatility of the vertebrate skeleton comes in part from its movable joints. So the basic model of a vertebrate skeleton can be altered to fit different needs. Um, and one of the ways that's easily altered are by different joints. We have ball and socket joints that allow movement in all directions, like your shoulder. We have hinge joints that are movement in one plane, um, knee, and then you have pivot joints that allow rotation. And look, if you look at your wrist, you can rotate your wrist. Those bones will rotate in their place. They don't get stuck as you move them. You have two bones in your forearm, and that allows for rotation. Okay, so here are examples of those different kinds of joints. You have your ball and socket, classically your shoulder. Also, your hip joint, both are ball and uh, socket. You have um, you, your humerus here, you have a hinge joint, right? So this is just going to rotate in one direction. It's going to allow this to swing this way. And then, it, again, if you rotate your wrist, so here's your um, forearm here. And if you rotate it, you, you can feel that those joints will actually spin in their sockets, and that way they don't kind of jam up and prevent you from rotating your wrist. Okay. Bones are complex living organisms. They are moist living tissue. We tend to see them as these sort of dry, hard things, hard as a rock, dry as a bone, whatever. Well, yeah, that's true after you've been dead, uh, but while you're alive, um, your bones uh, have, you know, blood going to them. They're producing blood. They're very much alive. They have fibrous connective tissue that covers the outer surface, uh, cartilage at the joints, and then the bone cells live in a matrix of flexible collagen fibers embedded in a hard calcium um, and phosphate sort of, um, what do I want to call that? kind of like a beehive, bee comb thing. Um, so, but very much alive, not dry at all, blood going, bringing living cells, you know, their, their nutrients and, and, you know, your bone marrow. It, it's all alive. We, we tend to think of it, I think, really too much as being dry and hard. That's not true. Okay, your long bones have a central cavity. And that stores yellow bone marrow, which is mostly fat. Um, so again, you probably don't think of fat being in your bones, but your, your big, heavy bones 
Um, same in an animal, the bone marrows and the big heavy bones. And then you have spongy bone is at the ends of the long bones. So in the middle you'll have the bone marrow, but towards the end it's really spongy. And that contains red marrow. So the yellow marrow is the fat. The red marrow in this spongy part uh, produces blood cells. And blood vessels and nerves course through the channels and service the bone cells. So again, think very much alive. It certainly hurts like heck when you break them. Um, there's nerves, there's all kinds of things going on in there. All right, so here's a nice diagram of that. So here you have the sponginess up here. This is the red marrow. Here's the fatty yellow marrow. Here's the connective tissue. Um, all alive, even though it's that honeycomb shape or the spongy shape that we think of um, when something's dead and dried out. All this is service. There's nerves, right? So. Um, alive, producing stuff. In fact, um, your sternum will produce a lot of uh, red blood cells, and when you guys are in growth spurts, and so do your legs, by the way, so when you're in growth spurts, sometimes kids will complain that um, either their chest hurts or their legs hurt, the bones actually hurt, and that's because they're pumping out so much, so many red blood cells. Okay, broken bones can heal themselves, um, and what determines whether a bone breaks is the strength of the skeleton. So if you have a young, strong skeleton, it's obviously less likely to break. And the angle and amount of force applied. So if you fall just right, even though you didn't fall very far, you can break a bone. Um, bones heal themselves. They build new bone, and they actually usually build it up stronger than it was. You can tell where people have had a broken bone. There's actually more um, calcium and stuff laid on that break to... Uh, reinforce it. Um, so a lot of times when you cast a broken bone, you're not realigning it, you're just preventing it from being broken further. But of course, if you've really broken your bone, like broken, broken it, um, you can have to do realignment and traction is holding it so it heals um, straight. All right. Severely injured or diseased bones can actually be replaced. Think hip transplant there. Oh, here's a nice x-ray of a really, really look on the left side, like, oh, you know someone did something stupid here. Um, those are really broken leg, leg bones on the left, and then you can see they've actually put pins in them on the right. And you can see, check out down here, see the pins holding them in, Ugh, and pins, okay, yeah, that's lovely. Weak, bit brittle Bones, like osteoporosis, is a serious health problem. Can't even be in young people. Yes, diet, coke, drinking does make this worse. Um, osteoporosis is a bone disease characterized by low bone mass structure degeneration of the bone matrix. Lowered estrogen production makes this a problem among older women. So you hear about it a lot in the elderly population. Unhealthy lifestyles have made osteoporosis a serious concern for young people as well. And yes, they're, they are talking about drinking Coke, which has phosphorus, which tends to eat away at your teeth and your bones. Okay, on your left, you see a nice healthy bone. And on your right, you see a bone that has osteoporosis. Uh, the skeleton and muscles interact in movement. Muscles are connected to bones by tendons. Okay, and then you have antagonistic pairs of muscles. So these are each, each muscle group comes in a pair. One is going to move the muscle one way, and the opposing pair will pull it back the other way. Because muscles only contract. They can only pull the skeleton. They can never push it. So if you're going to pull your leg up, how do you get it back down? Well, so if your quads pull, then your hamstrings are going to pull it the other direction. Or if you're looking at your arms, um, your biceps can pull your hand towards you, but your tricep is going to pull it away from you. So you always have these opposing pairs of muscles. Okay, There's a nice picture of an opposing pair. You have the bicep that pulls it one direction and the tricep that pulls it the other. They are both attached to the skeleton by tendons. Each muscle cell has its own contractile apparatus, so a muscle consists of bundles of parallel muscle fibers. Then each muscle fiber is a bundle of smaller myofibrils. 
a single cell with many nuclei. Each myofibril consists of repeating units called sarcomeres, and a sarcomere is composed of overlapping thick myosin and thin acting filaments, um, and it's the muscle's contractile apparatus. And I think, as in all things, it's easier to visualize this with a diagram. All right, so here's the diagram. Makes life a little easier. You have your myofibril. So here's your filaments, all right? A sarcomere is the repeating pattern. So you see the Z lines, these blue lines. These, when we look under the microscope, we see striations. So you see these lines. Each one of these repeats. So here's a sarcomere, here's a sarcomere, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. And it repeats all through the muscle, all right? Then we have these uh, myofibrils. So then when we look down here, this is a nice diagram, sort of an example of how they work. You have thick ones and you have thin ones and they alternate and that's because you'll see I think in the next or next slide um, that one will grab a hold of each other and they'll slide across each other and that's what shortens the muscle so these bands here are actually these um, uh, filaments one is made of myosin and the other one is actin so and they alternate okay a muscle contracts when the thin filament slides across the thick filament in the sliding filament model of muscle contraction, a sarcomere contracts when its thin filament slides across the thick one. Contraction is caused by energy-consuming interactions of myosin and actin molecules. When we say energy-consuming, I assume you know we mean ATP-consuming. This is going to involve um, ATP being turned into ADP. The sequence of detach, extend, pull, attach, detach, attend, uh, pull, um, is, occurs repeatedly in a muscle. So these are going to grab hold of each other and pull, and then release, and then grab hold, pull, release. Each time they do this, you're going to use an ATP molecule. So the ATP binds to the myosin head, which is released from an actin filament. You might want to go back to this slide, actually, after you look at the diagram. You have hydrolysis of ATP, which extends the myosin head. Um, the myosin head attaches to the actin binding site, and then you have what's called the power stroke, which is the um, we're going to slide these two and shorten them. So the power stroke slides the actin, the thin filament, toward the center of the sarcomere, and this is going to shorten and contract the muscle. Okay, and aren't diagrams nice? They make it so much easier. So here we have your myosin head. Here you have the thin active filament. The whole point of this is going to be to grab and slide this so that the whole thing gets shorter. We're going to slide these across. So here we start. We have some kind of stimuli that says um, contract. So your brain says contract. Um, the ATP binds to the myosin head. This is the myosin head which is released from the active filament, actin filament here. So here it was. The hydrolysis of ATP causes this head to, it changes shape, right? It's going to come out, and then it's going to bind here, and then it's going to stroke it in. So watch, it's going to, the ATP gets hydrolyzed, it's going to come, bend the myosin head out. Here we bind, so we were bound initially over here. But we've used an ATP to grab over here now. And then down here, it's going to return. The myosin head's going to return to its original shape. And in doing so, it's sliding this fiber this way. That shortens the muscle. And there's hundreds of these when we look at a muscle, right? It's not just this one. There's hundreds of them doing this exact thing. And you have ATP everywhere, or hopefully you have ATP everywhere. And so some of these will be bound, they'll be in this position, and that'll prevent backsliding, it'll prevent your muscle from relaxing as long as the signal is there to contract. You'll have a few bound, and you'll have a few of these myosins that are doing this process of release where they are, move the head out, bind to a site further out, and then do the power stroke, pull that filament in. A motor neuron is what stimulates the muscle contraction. So that never just happens randomly. We have to tell it to happen. A motor neuron consists of 
um, the motor neuron and a muscle fiber that it controls. So the neuron can go to uh, the muscle fibers. That's plural. Usually they control more than one. A motor neuron can stimulate more than one muscle fiber because it's going to have a lot of branches. And the neuron's axons form nuclear muscular conjunctions with muscle fiber, which makes sense. Nu neuromuscular. Muscular, what did I say? Neuromuscular. It's a neuron with a junction to a muscle, right? So it's not neuron to neuron. Now we're talking neuron to muscle. Okay. Then you have the action potential from the neuron triggers release of acetylcholine. That is the trigger to contract. That is your neurotransmitter. Okay. Acetylcholine diffuses across the neuromuscular junction to the muscle fibers. They change in fiber membrane permeability triggers the action potential that passed to the center of the muscle cell. Then you have calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum initiating the filament sliding and muscle contraction. Alright, so here you go. You can see from one nerve, one neuron, you can control. Here are the little junctions, those little neuromuscular jun um, junctions I was talking about, where it's going to go from a nerve uh, a neuron to a muscle, right, and then send the signal that way. Okay, so there's your motor uh, neuron axon. So this little arrow represents an action potential signal. We're going to diffuse chemicals across it. The chemicals are going to tell this to start um, the endoplasmic reticulum to kick out the calcium, which is going to cause the little myelin heads to start moving across the, the um, actin and the whole muscle will contract. All right, athletic training increases strength and endurance. We all know that to be true. It is obviously true. You have aerobic exercise. Aerobic means with oxygen and you have anaerobic exercise. Anaerobic is without oxygen. Um, and so they do two different things. Aerobic exercise will increase efficiency and um, fatigue resistance of muscles. So the more you do it, the less fatigued your muscles will get. The anaerobic is bulking up the actual muscle fiber. Um, so your aerobic is going to increase the efficiency. It's going to increase blood flow to the mitochondria size. It's going to strengthen your heart. It's going to strengthen your whole circulatory system and just make you stronger in general. The aerobic would be like, you know, going for a short, not a super short, a, a run. Um, usually aerobic, you're looking at, I don't know, half hour, a little bit more. Get your heart rate up, but not crazy, crazy fast. It's, it's just going to be the nice aerobic zone is an increased heart rate, I think to about 70% of your uh, maximum heart rate. Anaerobic, on the other hand, is just bulking up. It's going to build the larger muscles that generate power. So it's going to increase the size of the muscle fibers. Um, you're going to have more glycogen stored as a fuel reserve because your muscles are assuming you're going to do this again. The structure function theme underlies all parts of and activities of an animal. So when we look at why something's built the way it is, it's because of what it needs to do. Animal movement is a visible reminder that function emerges from structure. So it integrates the senses, the nervous system, and the motor system. Athletic abilities result from adaptations that have been refined through natural selection and contribute to our survival as a species. So being able to run fast is probably a good thing if a tiger is chasing you.